not to mention the big one in Camasilla, which is the only one that got any kind of real attention uh, due to the fact that uh, an individual or several individuals happened to film the contents of that bunker complex. The order was given to blow the place up rather than uh, the normal procedures when you find a place like uh, that, that magnitude holding the contents that it did. Uh, there were other means of disposal. The area was secured uh, and what surprises me is the fact that we received no warning. No one was instructed to get into any kind of mop gear or any type of pro chemical protective posture, although it's questionable whether uh, it would have helped anyway. Well, we were issued, you know, MOP suit military occupational protective posture is what MOP stands for. MOP suits, we were issued them, but they were useless to us after the first three days after we opened the package. So you get in country, they issue you a brand new suit, it's got a charcoal filter in it, but the minute that, you know, package has been opened and that suit has been liberated, that suit is useless. You can't keep putting it on and taking it off. The Department of Defense has long touted that American troops are the best prepared, trained, and equipped in the world. Unfortunately, the equipment that was meant to save their lives may very well have cost them their health in Desert Shield and Storm. Information has now been obtained that proves that the chemical suits sold to the Department of Defense during 1989 were, in fact, useless. Isratex, a company from Raynell, West Virginia, sold nearly 800,000 defective suits that later proved to be full of tears, holes, and poor stitching. One hole can mean the life or death of a soldier during a chemical exposure. The company subsequently filed for bankruptcy and its owners have never faced accountability for their actions. The Camasilla Bunker Complex is estimated to be 100 bunkers and 60 warehouses, each the size of a super Walmart. The destruction of Camasilla was not even discussed until June of 1996 when it was addressed by Senator Specter at the Senate Armed Forces hearing. General Schwarzkopf said the following. As I stated, the first time I ever heard of Camasilla was in 1996 when it was first announced by the Department of Defense and nobody was more surprised than I was. A little later in his testimony, General Schwarzkopf apparently contradicted himself when he said the following. Uh, I remember General Franks came to me, and I assume it was Camasilla he was talking about at the time, because I, I can't, I, it was about the same time frame, and talked about this huge ammunition dump that they had found with, with literally tons and tons and tons of ammunition in it, and there was no way they could possibly retrograde it, and I challenged him on that, and he convinced me that, no, they couldn't retrograde it, and therefore they were going to destroy it in place. I said, fine, now that's Camasilla. From what I heard about the size of the bunker that Franks was talking about and the others that they blew up, these were huge bunkers with, with crates and crates and crates and crates of ammunition in them. And, and I can only assume that, that they just, they looked, they either didn't recognize them or didn't see them at the time. We were under pressure to, to, to withdraw. And under the pressures of withdrawal, we did destroy everything we could so that the Iraqis couldn't fall back in on it using some other war against us. General Schwarzkopf just stated that he was concerned about the Iraqis regaining control of the ammunition that was contained at the Camasilla Ammunition Depot. However, several individuals have come forward with other reasons as to why the bunker depots were hastily destroyed. I'm Dan Topolsky. I was the Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Defense NCO for B Company, 37th Engineer Battalion. Uh, I was on the Camasilla Bunker Complex mission. Sergeant Topolsky was one of the nuclear, biological, and chemical non-commissioned officers in charge of identifying munitions at Camasilla Bunker Complex in Iraq. I felt betrayed. I felt like um, we had been sold out for dollars when I saw what I saw inside those bunkers. Even though I had 40-some years in the military service, if you were to bring in a bunch of ammunition and pile it up in front of me, and one of them was a 122-millimeter rocket with chemicals in it, I would not be able to tell you that that had chemicals in it particularly if it was an Iraqi rocket with Arabic writing on it or something of the sort. We identify ours when we had them in a very specific way by color coding. I don't have the slightest idea what the Arabs did. General Schwarzkopf stated that we identified our weapons by color coding. 
According to Sergeant Topolsky, the colored bands identified biological and chemical munitions inside the Camasilla bunker complex. According to Sergeant Topolsky, the yellow or purple bands indicate chemical munitions. The green bands represent biological munitions. General Schwarzkopf also said he could not identify munitions, especially if they had Iraqi markings on them. You will also note these munitions were plainly marked in English and indicated these munitions were supplied by countries like Jordan, England, Russia, as well as the United States of America. According to the 1972 Geneva Convention, weapons of mass destruction are illegal. Therefore, according to Sergeant Dan Topolsky, it is very likely that these munitions were destroyed not so much to prevent Saddam Hussein from regaining control of them, but to destroy the evidence of these countries breaking international law. The 37th Engineer Battalion, way back in the air campaign, was ordered by our battalion commander not to wear our protective overgarments unless specifically told to do so. My company pretty much ignored that order because my company commander supported me when I said that that was dead wrong and he's going to wind up with a dead company if he listens to it. Now, a lot of the other companies in the battalion didn't do that. On April 17, 1997, General Colin Powell testified before the same Senate panel. And as was the case of General Schwarzkopf, he was not required to take the oath to tell the truth. In regard to the chemical mop suit, General Powell said the following. We used protective overgarments, boots, masks. I don't think you have seen a single battle scene from the Desert Storm War where our troops were not in mop gear. Well, the Department of Defense officials continue to lie about what we know and what happened during Gulf War I, but it's real simple. The chemical agent alarms went off. There was no other reason for them to go off. The individuals got sick. There's no other reason for them to get sick. And medical tests, my own medical tests, confirm, absolutely confirm, the sarin and cyclosarin exposures, for which I had been notified directly by uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense by name in a personal letter that, hey, Doug, you got exposed to sarin and cyclosarin because you were downwind from Camasilla. But Camasilla was only one of over a hundred sites that we deliberately blew up after the completion of the ground war from March through the fall of 1991. Even though the Department of Defense continues to deny the widespread use of chemicals and biologicals during the first Gulf War, Jonathan Tucker of the Monterey Institute of International Studies has demonstrated evidence for the use of chemicals in the Kuwaiti theater of operations. The U.S. intelligence reports show the presence of Iraqi chemical weapons. Military log entries describe the discovery of chemical munitions in Iraqi bunkers during and after the ground war. There are incidents in which troops reported acute, numerous symptoms of toxic chemical exposure. There's credible detections of chemical warfare agents made by Czech, French, and American forces. Chemical warfare agents that were detected by coalition forces during the Gulf War include the nerve agent Tabin, Sarin, Cyclosarin, and the blister agents Sulfur, Mustard, and Lewisite. To this date, there has been no diagnosis or treatment offered by the Department of Defense or Veterans Administration. Dr. Robert Haley, MD of the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, Texas, has detected damage in the brains of those Gulf War veterans who were near the explosion of Camasilla. Those injuries had resulted in not only increased social problems, but also a 90% divorce rate and increased crime rates among those vets who show damage in the area of the brain that controls judgment. The children of Gulf War veterans have shown increased defects such as 
golden heart syndrome, a missing eye or ear, major organ or digestive deformities, and general failure to thrive. Thirteen years after the Gulf War, the Department of Defense still calls the Gulf War illness a mystery disease. Either the Pentagon employs the most incompetent researchers and physicians in the world, or the cover-up is by design that these troops are being denied meaningful medical care. We can only conclude that the Department of Defense is waiting for an army to die. The threat of biological warfare is nothing new to the military, but the Persian Gulf War placed a special emphasis on it. This renewed emphasis caused the Defense Department to look at how it was protecting men and women in uniform from this battlefield threat, this unseen enemy. Staff Sergeant Noah Berg looks at one of those enemies and what is being done to fight it. The Defense Department says it can be a big threat on the modern battlefield. Anthrax, most commonly associated with livestock, and the type that worries those military leaders most is the type that is inhaled. Sometimes people refer to it as very early stages as something like a common cold. But then uh, it goes, the person goes downhill very quickly. Because of the potential anthrax threat, last year the Defense Department ordered vaccinations. And one of the first in line was Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Eric Benkin. Despite isolated protests, the vast majority of medical experts endorsed the vaccine's use. And despite charges that the so-called Gulf War syndrome and anthrax are connected, Huxel says that's just not true. The Defense Department continues to stress the safety of the anthrax vaccine, and all troops headed for the Persian Gulf receive the inoculation series. We had all the problems from immunizations. Our team was tasked with to put together the anthrax vaccine program in theater. But we were also ordered do not record lots, batches, doses, who got them, what their reactions were, when they got them, or how many they got. Direct orders. There's enough paperwork right now to prove there is a Gulf War illness, and there's certain medicines that control it, and that's all they're doing right now is controlling it for a few. Staff Sergeant Mark Zeller was a member of Special Operations in the 18th Airborne Corps. He served in the Iraq-Iran War, Desert Shield, and Desert Storm campaigns. And we're all forced to uh, roll up our sleeves and pull down our pants and get shots in the gluteus and in the uh, tricep muscles of our arms. We, we all started getting sick, and, and, uh, but we didn't think nothing of it because our flight surgeon was telling us that it's hygiene that's getting us. We're all not taking baths every day. It's like maybe once a week or once every three days. And uh, that hygiene was supposedly getting the best of us, so we didn't think anything of it after that. And they punched us with all these different vaccines, uh, you know, supposedly to protect us, and knowing that, you know, some of these had never been tested uh, on humans. My neck bones are degenerating. My lower back's degenerating. No one knows why. They want to go in there and scrape it and biopsy it. I'm like, I don't want to be in a wheelchair afterwards. Pretty, uh, it's pretty damaging to a guy that used to be in special operations and jumped out of airplanes for a living. So. The use of vaccines in the military with recruits and servicemen and women is well documented. What is not well known is the relationship between the Department of Defense and pharmaceutical companies who have a vested interest in the widespread use of vaccines. What is contained in the vaccines and just how many of those vaccines that were given that were in fact experimental. The experimentation of individual military members by the bureaucracy of the military medical establishment crosses all party lines. Military experimental use of vaccines have been conducted during the past 50 years. 
The senior Bush administration ordered the use of experimental vaccines, anthrax and botulinum during the buildup of the first Gulf War.